The inside story of a small group of photographers, the Bang Bang Club, captured some of the most compelling pictures of South Africa's violent transition to democracy. For Kevin Carter, Ken Oosterbrook, Joao Silva and Greg Marinovich, it was a time of exhilarating madness and much soul-searching. Nine days before South Africa's first democratic elections, photographer Ken Oosterbrook died, killed by a stray bullet from the gun of a peacekeeper. He was a member of the Bang Bang Club, a group of award-winning photographers who recorded the images of South Africa's hidden war in the townships. His close friend, fellow photographer Greg Marinovich, was seriously wounded. Their quest for the ultimate picture had cost them dearly. This is the end, beautiful friend. They became known as the Dead Zones, the no man's land in black townships. Here, the bloodiest battles were fought in the violent lead up to South Africa's first democratic elections. It was here that a handful of photographers ventured time and time again to tell the story of life and death few white South Africans were aware of. All too often, they were forced to decide when to press the shutter and when to put their cameras down. I was alone in this hospital and um, in Carter people found this guy who allegedly had caused that, but he was, turned out to be a ponder later. But they accused him of having shot at them and they were trying to get into his dormitory room and eventually they got in and then he made a break for it and he ran and I ran behind them and he fell or just tripped or whatever. And they started killing him, you know, with handheld weapons, you know, sharpened sticks and spears and knob carries and things. And I was very close, you know, arm's length, watching it, photographing the whole thing. And I was like, utterly unprepared for this. You know, it was the first few days of the hostile war. And you know, we knew something was going on, but like, who knew what it really meant in reality? And that completely freaked me out, you know. And the fact that I didn't say anything, I, you know, I, I kept quiet, I just took pictures, you know. It wasn't how I viewed myself as a, who I was and what my moral viewpoint was in life. Less than a month later, in September 1990, Marinovich was faced with a similar moral dilemma. And suddenly a train stops and Lindsay Chabalala, as we later found out what his name was, got off the train and uh, got taken by the comrades and went through this very slow, painful, torturous death. You know. But that time I did try and speak out and try and make sure that, you know, who is he? Is he really a combatant? Is he really a spy as he was being accused of? And, and, you know, there was one guy communicating with one of the participants all along, and he understood exactly. And I was trying to explain what happened in Mansfield and this and that. And he said, yeah, we know what you're talking about, Doctor. We know. We know he's a spy, you know. And, you know, even though I did what I suppose was morally correct, you know, journalism notwithstanding, um, it was the same effect. There was no difference. I was as helpless there as I had been previously. <laughs> Marinovich was one of four young photographers who drifted together in the turmoil of the early 90s. Marinovich, Zhao Silva, Ken Oosterbrook and Kevin Carter soon became close friends. They formed the core of a group of conflict photographers who inspired magazine headlines and became known as the Bang Bang Club. There is no club as such, okay? Uh, it was a term that uh, the photographers who covered conflict used amongst themselves um, and they used the term bang bang we're going after the bang bang we're stressed from the bang bang um, the bang bang was very hard last week um, and it's obvious to know where the term comes from gun club and bang bang club basically was a magazine headline 
we were all eye profile within, you know, the South African photogenist community. So it was easy to label us as Sami, you know. And to be perfectly honest, uh, though there was a certain amount of embarrassment, there was also a certain amount of pride in the fact that you've been acknowledged by your peers, you know. Joao and I became friends because we both saw in each other, we liked the way we responded to situations. There's a certain empathy, you know, you're dealing with grieving people. And some people are really callous and real fuckwits, you know. Whereas Joao and I, I liked the way he dealt with people, he liked the way I dealt with people. We liked the way we dealt with danger together. We liked all that kind of stuff. And um, we suited each other, you know, in terms of work. And later, after we got <laughs> married, <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's one of those things. You can work together without conflicting or embarrassing each other or putting each other in danger. Bonds like that, I think, are formed very strong when you under that kind of, you know, in those kind of situations and whatever, and you're relying on one another, not only for friendship and whatever, but also for, like, your safety. Most of the photographers, the white photographers, you know, supported apartheid, quite honestly. And they had absolutely no empathy or no feeling for the political situation. And the government line at the time of black on black violence, factional violence, tribal violence, all that shit, you know, it was, people were buying it and reproducing it and going along with it, you know. So, and they also weren't prepared to leave the comfort zone in search of fixes, which Ra certainly was, and I certainly was, and Kevin was, and Ken was. Wurstebrook, Carter, Silva, and Marinovich were young and full of life when they became professional witnesses to the bloody and vicious civil war, a war just a few kilometers from their own tranquil white suburbs. There is an adrenaline kick, and when you're doing stories that are not sad, that are exciting, that's wonderful. That's a great adrenaline kick. So you have the ambiguity between like some kind of horror and adrenaline becomes very complicated and difficult emotionally. We'd get, actually, you know, just to give you a for instance, we get very excited, and this again might sound very callous, but we get very excited when we come away from a situation that was highly dangerous, highly explosive, there'd be bullets flying, all that kind of crap. We'd come away with pictures and nobody got killed. Oh, We'd actually cool. get very excited over that. We'd say, cool, it, nobody died. Yeah, but look at these images. Yeah. Um, so there's that, you know. So when somebody does die, you, you still have that kind of, wow, that was so cool and wow, that was so dangerous. That, you know, nothing, quite honestly, makes you feel as alive as when you've come away from some point that you know you, it could have all ended there. I think they were adrenaline junkies, uh, kind of the kind of people who thrive on on danger and a challenge. If you found yourself in the middle of a conflict situation where bullets are still flying, you know, then it's, you know, it's, it's pretty mechanical. The instinct takes over and you start looking for the images and looking for ways to stay safe. And I think they, they developed a certain fascination for the violence. Um, I think they were all very brave people and people who were on the edge. Um, people, I've often thought just from a personal perspective that when you pulled towards violence and excitement in that way, that you almost feel more alive, kind of the closer you are to death. And when you have no control, really. That's the interesting you know? part. And uh, that makes you feel very alive, and that's the addictive thing. Because everything tingles in your body, you know? It's, it's, an, it, it's adrenaline, yes, uh, but it is, it is addictive. <laughs> and also, you're in, situ you're in competitive situations. Mm. So you see somebody like Jim move that him extra feet closer, and you see that he's photographing something, and then, then the whole professional thing kicks in. You know, you realize, well, he's, he's out shooting me, I'm looking bad, I've got to go stand close to get the same image, because otherwise, you know, Time Magazine's going to have something that, you know, the wires aren't going to have, depending on what I was working for at the time. So that's, that's a huge factor in, uh, in, in, in making you go a little bit closer, you know. Hey, Fappy! But there was also a gentler side to the Bang Bang Club. In 1992, Marinovich met the Rapu family of Meadowlands in Soweto while covering the death and mayhem. A lasting friendship developed. We, we, in fact, we hated journalists that time. We hated, we hated policemen, we hated uh, soldiers, we hated journalists. 
I think you are fortunate <laughs> to find me in a very in a sad nice moment. Then, you know, the way he talked to us that evening, uh, I think I think we had the we had the we had that thing that you must bond with him. You really doing it because you cared about the story, and so obviously we would develop various friendships and stuff. You know, it's our own country. You know, how can you can you do that parachute type journalism in your own country? The Bang Bang Club's images were extremely violent, and soon they became controversial. Some colleagues said the four friends formed a crazy and gung ho exclusive club. Others romanticized and glorified them. They were admired for doing extreme journalism for doing what they, because people knew, you know, it's like anybody, if you put your life on the line for something, you, you, you get a bit of respect. They're like the fighter pilots and the stuntmen of the media world. These are the, the hot shots, the long range recce patrol guys who go out and there's absolutely a certain drama, a charisma, a sort of a glory to what they do. Quite a few photographers were actually quite scathing about them. And I don't know why, I don't know if it was because they felt a sense that their own pictures were in some way invalidated because they weren't of the latest body decapitated or action shot, or if because in some way they actually felt that these boys were feeding off violence. There is a certain glorification to the role of the combat photographer. Some photographers will, would be very clear, would clearly say, I can't do that, I don't do that stuff. And I, I think, would often say they felt more sensitive, or they were too sensitive to do it. I don't think the Bang Bang Club were any less sensitive, but I think they had a particular, uh, a particular sort of mindset, a disposition, a kind of a, a group culture that people felt excluded from. The Bang Bang Club lived on the edge, and the constant exposure to violence took its toll. I was completely unprepared for it, and psychologically and emotionally. And I was, you know, completely traumatized by it, quite honestly. What do you do when those images have been burnt into your brain? Um, you can consciously, you can go and sit in Rocky Street and, and Irish coffee your time away and, and hope that that'll happen, but they burnt into your brain, you know? So that manifests itself, post-traumatic trauma. I'm not sure who fired the opening shots, but shots started going off, and then a hang of a lot of shots started going off. We dived out of the car, stayed low for the period. I did notice that a, a Mercedes in the convoy was hit um, and remained stationary. There was no time to process it, and I think they, part of their perpetual kind of every morning doing this, doing that, just flitting from one assignment to the other was a way of, of not letting anything really sink in. Only one of the four had a drug problem, you know, a real hardcore drug problem. And that was Kevin and the rest of us didn't, you know. We, you know, a little bit of dope, a little bit of drinking, that kind of stuff, Sometimes no problem. Sometimes too much alcohol. But yeah, no. too much alcohol and stuff, but not, you know, it, was, it wasn't the life, it wasn't our lives. Drugs and drink were not our lives. Oh, there were a lot of problems, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and people, some of them cope better than others. I mean, Kevin didn't cope. There were times when it was so intense that, you know, after long periods, you'd be pretty saturated and you'd be numb at the end of that, you know. He had a stable family life and his parents are stable, normal people. I mean, he had me and my sister was living with us. We had the cats. So, I mean, he dealt with things either by coming home and just being normal, and when things got tough, he was angry and drinking a lot, and not good. There'd be times where Kevin and I would, would have these long drinking binges, you know, where we'd really drink a lot and then try to figure life out in that, kind of state of, in that kind of state of mind, which is not always the clever thing to do. Because you know you are talking about serious issues, you are dealing with serious emotions, and think and you know kind of trying to find reason in it through a cloud of alcohol or or, or, or dope, whatever, not always um, 
didn't always help. Yeah. Didn't always help us see things as clearly as we might have if we had maybe had gone to therapy, you know, which we didn't. None of us went to we therapy. We should have all gone to therapy, seriously. You know, we, we I mean, that never came up as an option. Yeah. They were too macho. They were like soldiers in a way. They were, you know, boys don't cry. And I think there was that whole vibe about them. In 1993, Kevin Carter rocketed to fame with a photo of a child and a vulture in Sudan. He won praise from US President Bill Clinton and a Pulitzer Prize for it. But his ethics were questioned. I think he, in retrospect, only in retrospect, he failed what he thought he could have done, even though it was just to comfort the kid, because the kid wasn't in any danger. It wasn't, that wasn't the issue. But if he could have seen with hindsight what that picture looks like and thought to himself, I'm going to be haunted by that kid forever because of that image, even though the image suggests something that wasn't really there or was partially there. It's tough to deal with, and people start questioning his morality. Now, think of it. Um, here you are, a photographer in South Africa, the whole bit. Uh, you've got your own personal problems, and all of a sudden, a Pulitzer lands in your lap, okay? And the President of the United States has taken notice of you, not only taken notice of you, but expressing huge admiration and respect for the work that you've done. Certainly within conflict situations where you, you face with, with, you know, where you, you might have to help somebody, you know, it's, you have to keep it in, in context. You have to keep it in context first in, A, what are you doing there? B, what is going on at the time? I mean, are you, you know, he's helping the kid or helping anybody can can change the situation in any way. Um, you worried about your own safety. You, you know, there's a variety of things going on. In, you know, inside you, you've got adrenaline. You've got all, you've got all these moral issues going in and out. And sometimes it's easier not to think and just do. On 18th April 1994, Carter was in Johannesburg at a press interview about his Pulitzer Prize. The then National Peacekeeping Force was in Tokosa as were Carter's three friends. When this Vote Mandela banner was being strung up, you know, everyone knew that hostile people were going to start shooting, and they did, and you know, ran for cover, and that developed into that situation at the wall. You know. So we didn't think we were going to get shot. We were cautious, obviously. And, you know, it wasn't like we were doing any unnecessary risks that day. Soldiers were going to go, uh, you know, try to get in and flush out the snipers, you know, and we were behind them, behind the wall which gave us, you know, sufficient cover from all angles, except the guys we were. We so, you know, in our minds, you know, yeah, we weren't taking fire. The fire was all around us, none in our direction. So as far as we were concerned, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was you know, you know, you never expect to Man and beast. Toiling together as yeah, they have you know, through the ages in the arid around, Madura countryside. When the ploughing is done in this harsh, poor place, farmers turn to their one passion the traditional sport of bull racing called Karapansapi. It's the night before the bull racing finals, the biggest event of the year. These fine wall, specimens are among the favourites. The they're already and district champions, like and the now the they're being primed for greater the victory. They could have driven them with the the, the handlers are preparing a strange potion. Dozens of eggs are added to a dark concoction of herbs, honey and rice wine. It's usual to feed these bulls a hundred eggs a day. The devilish potion is forced down the bull's throat. Then it's time for a washdown and a massage. Did they mean to shoot us on purpose? Did they do it out of sheer panic and bad training? Nothing can be left to chance. A local shaman you called Adukun bestows the bulls with magical winning balls, powers. And they're being told to stop shooting. Later, in right. private, the Dukun puts a curse on all the other competitors. Trouble is, sure. other teams are performing the same rituals, the same sort of magical spoiling tactics. 
Race day is a spectacle. The bulls are not just judged on their racing ability, but also their beauty and poise. Gamelan music is played to reinforce any magical spells and to excite the bull. When it's time for the races to begin, everyone is on edge. The creatures settle. The starter gives the signal and they're off. It's a free-for-all down a straight track. The jockeys appear to have little control, and it's all over in a flash. The best time over 100 metres is just nine seconds, faster than any Olympic sprint champion. The real nitty-gritty of bull racing takes place at the starting line. Close up and personal, you discover the cruel side of the sport. Sticks and spikes on a red raw hide. A devilish contraption applied to where it really hurts. And that salt being rubbed into the wounds. There's little magic going on here. Wielding the whip is Haji Imam Tawa, the owner of five past champions. He's a rich man from bull racing. It's all about the fine muscles in the neck and the back, which need careful massage, he says. No mention of the prodding and poking at the rear end to work the creatures into a frenzy. He says picking the right jockey is important too. I think Kevin just felt Jadi setiap sapi itu kan enggak sama maunya gimana, maunya gimana enggak sama. Jadi itu khusus memang. Misalnya seperti kepunyaan saya, itu khusus ada. Kalau dinaiki orang lain ya Larinya kurang. The jockeys are village boys picked for their courage. And, and, and These are youngsters who dream of making the big time. Ten-year-old Yanta has been training all season, surviving countless spills and winning races. Today, it's make or break in a tough field. Pulitzer Prize winning South African news for South Africa. Well, it's worth a punt, and there are plenty of bookies ready to take my money. The idea is to simply place a bet on the bull wearing the colours red or yellow. I try to place a bet on red. Bit of wisdom. Later, I suppose. They're off. Red crosses first. But when I return to collect my winnings, the bookies insist I put my money on yellow. I've done my dough, and in this crowd, there's no point arguing. This is not a real man to be. Tom Marinovich has. The grand final race is now just minutes away, and the teams are preparing. Thank you. Yanta has made it through. Today, He's nervous but determined. Have started to confront For the bulls, the there's the more torture. They wrote a book on That's their story. hot mentholated story balm being friends. rubbed where no hand should the go. Club. Snapshots this creature is being literally fired up. Even the eyes are blinded by so hot liniment. Having to deal with it on a very All set now level. and <laughs> racing. <laughs> But really, the writing of the book and the book of 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 the book
Jiao Silva and Greg Marinovich. The winning Austin team is in bull racing heaven as the celebrations begin. They showed us what we can do. The winner's cup is held high. And the bulls? There'll be no more hot liniment, potions or prodding for these champions. They'll be put out to start to enjoy a life of bovine bliss. People started realising what's happening in, in South Africa and you mainly because of them. And I think that's the biggest inspiration to all of us, that we all are aware of what's happening now and now we're trying to do the same thing. The legacy is basically the, the body of work, the collective body of work. Um, and also the legacy of, of, of passion, the legacy of a reasonable amount of, I wouldn't say fearlessness because there was always fear, you know, but getting over that fear. Um, the legacy of professionalism, um, but basically the fact that they put the stuff on record. The Bang Bang Club South Africa is no different in that they were brave, half-crazed, driven professionals who went where other people feared to tread. What makes them unique in our context is that they are telling a South African story. <laughs>